Um, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to be here tonight. My name is Beth Renestis, and it's nice to see some familiar names in the uh, scroll chat. And um, I look forward to talking um, to you about what has been um, a really exciting development for uh, me personally, having to get to work on this, and also um, the opportunity for SLIS to be involved what I, in what I think will be uh, yet another trailblazing effort on our part to incorporate early childhood learning into our children's um, and youth services um, pathway. Tonight I'm going to give you um, several different um, oh just takes on how this course came uh, into being, uh, the collaborative nature of it, um, how we're making it our own for our academic purposes, and um, how we see it tying into our uh, strategic plan and our, uh, our whole mission of t uh, letting our students leave this program ready to work. And that means uh, being able to go on to a job and have the skills that are necessary uh, to place you maybe above someone else uh, applying for the same job. So I wanted um, just say I'm really sorry. I tend to um, get sick uh, often. I'm, <laughs> I'm a diabetic and I just have some issues with viruses. And so my voice is really shaky tonight. I'm getting the crud back. So I'm going to be sipping tea, but um, I did want to tell you that that might be why you, you, you hear a, a, a silence for a minute while I, I drink some more of my wonderful storytelling tea that I I used to make when I was a storyteller doing four and five um, sessions a day and I would lose my voice about three in. So, And also I really encourage you um, to make comments and questions and talk in the scroll chat. I tend to ignore the scroll chat because it, it makes me just go off on tangents and I would like to try and get through the presentation um, without going off on tangents. Uh, I'm renowned for those in the first place. But I I did want to say that I want your input tonight because this is a really, really um, interesting way that this came about. We in the Youth Pathways, I've been working for San Jose State off and on for seven years. I've been full time for four years. I always worked for SLIS um, in the YA, but then I started, um, as even when I was a children's librarian, I was still working with the young adult literature classes. When um, the opportunity came up to move to California in 2008, Dr. Haycock approached me about going full time because I was giving up my children's job in Denver. We moved here to be closer to our, our grandchildren and our daughter. And so I jumped at it. I, I, I have always loved teaching and I have um, mostly a background with uh, K-8. Uh, I have taught high school in the past as well. So this was uh, just something that Dr. Hirsch knew that I was interested in. I had brought this up years ago as to why we didn't have more early childhood literacy uh, classes. And not that we're all going to become reading specialists or we're going to go um, you know, work in a kindergarten, but as children's services um, you know, professionals and practitioners, it is absolutely essential that we have a background in ECL. So anyway, we've been talking about it. It's extremely difficult to add things to a program. Um, the bureaucracy of a university is just overwhelming. It's kind of like working for the federal government. So we have to be really clever um, in how we get new courses approved and how we get them offered. And that's why you see so many different numbers um, you know, in our, our course selections. Uh, you'll see a lot of 281s, 267s, and those are the, the way we get a class uh, in the door, so to speak. So, you know, the, the, uh, the main goal is that we want to provide students with skills. And we want them to be cutting edge skills because the, the jobs are changing, the environment is changing. And one of the reasons we wanted to bring this class on board is that we see that as giving the skills that support our mission. I highlighted the area in red on this slide, though, is because Dr. Hirsch wants to explore um, not just saying that you're going to be a children's librarian in a public library, but that you're going to be a children's services 
professional. And you may not work in a library environment. I just had a friend uh, who's now a friend. She was a student in, in this list program, but she has since moved to the East Coast. And she's now the director of literacy. Um, and so she didn't go into a public library situation. She went into a, a school system where she's actually being the director of their, the, all of the district's literacy uh, efforts. So that's really exciting to me to see the degree. Yes, it still has library and information science in it, but the information science is just as important to me now. Through the last year, I have been attending workshops and going and talking to people in a lot of different venues, figuring out what's our course going to look like. My background is in, uh, I'm not going to say old ECL, but ECL is changing, just like everything else is changing. Early childhood literacy is changing. So I was talking to employers. And one of the people I've met, and she's actually going to be a guest speaker in the fall at our uh, inaugural sailing of our, our ECL class, but Carolyn Brooks, who's a branch manager in El Dorado County, um, said to me during um, a workshop that they're very interested in what we're doing and they want us to be successful because as a prospective employer, she's looking for candidates that have this training. So. Right there, I saw a connection between SLIS mission, my interests, the youth pathways, faculty's interest, and the state library and employer's interest. And we'll get into what the state library is doing in a second. The other thing is that we want our students to make connections between early childhood development and literacy, literacy skills acquisition. And I'm including it for the whole entire children's department staff, from manager all the way down to shelvers who are dealing with the public, that everybody has a connection to understanding um, the child and the whole child, as well as understanding uh, if it's a daycare center or if it's a, uh, you know, I. For a while, I have a social degree background. I have a master's in social work. And I worked for LA County. And part of my uh, connecting with parents was also connecting them with literacy. And I knew a lot of librarians. I knew a, a lot of teachers. I knew a lot of literacy people in the, in the community. So we want to make sure that this class provides those connections. So that's a little bit about the whys. Um, and my slide got a little messed up when I, I was playing with fonts. I should have just left it alone. But anyway, we hadn't been able to present this class. And you know, it was frustrating. It's been on the agenda. And we, we say, oh, can we do it now? And it was like, oh, no, not yet. You know, we're trying to get cyber, you know, cyber security up, et cetera. But in February, the stars all lined up. The state library contacted Dr. Hirsch. And we're looking for a collaborative partnership with a university that had a library school, an information school, that wanted to partner with the State Library on their ELF 2.0 program. And Dr. Hirsch, who's a very smart woman, thought that this could be the spark that could actually propel this class forward and make it happen a lot faster on a different, um, you know, a different track. So all of a sudden, the course addition to our youth services pathway became a reality. So I have been very interested in the ELF Learning 2.0. The State Library is partnering um, with <coughs> excuse me, the Brazelton Foundation. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, them in a little bit. Um, but you know, we're not we're not going to partner with anybody to just specifically talk about you know a program or a theory. Um, our class is much more academic. It's looking at theory and then it's moving into practice. So we're going to have a little bit more broader terms. But this program, though, did give us the opportunity to collaborate with the state library and basically say. The State Library is putting together a touch points uh, program that they're going to take to libraries in the state of California. And, and they're hoping that this goes uh, much further than just California. But at the present time, I'm just talking about California. Um, and, and that will actually have impact on 
people that are already working in library or information environments, but they're also going to be training, um, they're going to start with library staff, but they will be broadening that out to uh, probably all staff that work in a library. So they will be able to provide some professional development training, you'll get a certificate, it'll be economically feasible for libraries to sign up to do this. What they wanted to partner was that at the same time, at least some of the same information is going to be done through our class. So that our students, when they come out and they go into a working environment, if those, that staff has already had part of this training, then you're all on the same page. It's not like when I first started and some people had a literacy background, some had no literacy background, some thought they didn't need a literacy background, um, you know, it wasn't our job to do what the schools did or, you know, you know all of those familiar things that I'm sure that several, uh, you know, of you could probably talk about. So we decided um, after having a meeting that we were going to move forward with our partnership. So right now we've been collaborating with the State Library. Uh, Dr. Bodart and I have attended several um, training sessions and uh, they are going to be offering another one and these are open to anybody. They're free, you just have to register. So watch out for later on um, in the year when they offer one, they're going to specifically gear it to uh, librarians and the Brazelton Touchpoints uh, program, but um, you'll get a wealth of information and it's a great way to network. Um, there were about 60 people at the workshop I went to, so I got to meet directors and, um, you know, children's department managers and daycare centers and it was just a phenomenal group of people to get involved with, so I, I suggest that strongly. So my, my background is I have um, a master's in social work, I also have an MLIS, uh, I've taught at high school level, middle school level, I've been a school librarian, I've been a manager in a school district in, in collection development, and I've also got um, a minor in psychology from my undergraduate degree which basically was English secondary ed. So I returned to library school really late in the 90s. Um, I decided uh, to totally switch careers and just go a different direction and, and I had always thought of library and information as some place that I wanted to go. So I took all of these skills and, I, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is I, I want you to all realize that you have so many skills that you already have. And so you need to be aware of what you have in your tool bag when you graduate. And so that's why having some childhood development, having some literacy is, is going to just absolutely serve you. Part of the reason why I got my first library, my first position uh, in the school district was that I had had literacy training. And the reason I got hired in my public library job as a, in the head of a children's department was that I had literacy training. Not necessarily a degree in it, but I could speak the speak. I could go out and talk with literacy uh, professionals all over our district. The other, um, the other reason why we're getting involved with um, the State Library is Dr. Hirsch's um, involvement with the Institution of Museum and Library Services. And they are really involved in connecting museums and libraries with lifelong learning and they have a huge early childhood initiative going on. They have just put out a wonderful, um, a wonderful paper that you can get off of their site, the ILMS site, which is basically called Growing Young Minds. Um, it is very current. It's got some great information in it. It's one of the foundation documents that I've been working with. Um, the old state library, you know, uh, librarian, Susan Hildreth, uh, actually has gone to ILMS. And she and Dr. Hirsch talk a lot and she is absolutely 100% supportive of what we're doing with bringing this uh, into our curriculum. So, um, so what does it take to do the research for something this broadly? Well, it takes a whole bunch of people putting their heads together. Uh, it takes a, a lot of people throwing ideas out into a ring and, and basically uh, me having to say, oh, well, I don't know if that fits into, into our goals. Oh, I don't know if that really fits into what we're doing. Um, part of the process that we go through within SLIS when we start to look at designing a course is that it has to go through uh, approval processes. 
we have a SLIS curriculum committee and then the university has a curriculum committee. So what I'm talking about to you tonight is the SLIS curriculum committee. Right now, the green sheet that we developed from this wonderful putting everybody's heads together about what needed to be included in this uh, class is in their hands. And I'm going to be showing you some parts of, um, of the course in the next few minutes. But um, they will determine you know, uh, everything that's in there, assignments, discussion threads, you know, all that type of thing. Are they um, all connecting together in a logical way? Are the course um, objectives sound? Um, are the competencies, um, can you see that the assignments tie to those competencies? What we want you to do when you come out of taking this class is to be able to use it in a practical sense, but to also to be able to use it for your ePortfolio and just um, to, to have things mastered that we think are very important for our, our children's librarians and information services people. So after we, um, I did about four months of collaborating and attending meetings and you know, just, just doing all kinds of conversing with different people uh, in the field. And that included some of my friends back in Colorado. It included some people that I met through US um, DLA uh, on the East Coast and, and in St. Louis. Uh, just a whole bunch of people I reached out to and said, we're designing this course. It's going to be part of library and information science schools curriculum, what do you think we need to be doing in it? What's going to make our course really relevant for what's going on in the community right now? And so uh, after I, we did all that, Dr. Bodart and I sat down and we started looking at what learning objectives and outcomes we wanted to have. So this is um, exactly what was turned in to the, uh, to the curriculum committee and it's how I've basically designed the assignments and uh, the reading and the text and everything around it. So the first one is a no-brainer. We want you to be able to identify the early literacy skills and activities that are involved in that. We also want students that take this class to be able to easily define the characteristics of early childhood development. That means you can walk the walk and talk the talk and you understand basic concepts. This is in no way an advanced ECL class. This is for people that are, are just coming to it or they've had a little bit of it in the past. They may be working in a library much like the one I worked in which just gave you so much professional development. Um, but they want to have that extra, that extra class in children's. And this one is very compatible with the Library 260A. I, I really hate the A on that, but the children's programming <coughs> and services class. I, have, I also teach that, so I've been trying really hard to have no, um, you can't get away with total overlap, uh, you know, eliminating all the overlap, but they are really two very different classes and that was one of our goals as well. The, the thing that's important to me is that you understand all the theories and that you understand the past research and how key those, those original research findings were and also that you understand the current research that's going on in the field of early childhood learning and, and literacy. You should be able when you come out of this class to talk about the differences and similarities and you should be able to do that uh, in a way that is both part of library and part of non-library environments. Now again, the reason why we're including non-library environments is because several of our uh, alumni have gone on into fields that are closely associated with libraries or closely associated with schools and school libraries, but they're in a non-library environment, but they're still working with children and literacy. And we want to be able to meet those students' needs as well in this class. So that's why you see that the non-library environment has been added in a lot of places. What we also want you to be able to do if you, if you were in a job position is what assessment tools are you going to use for evaluating whether your program and services are actually meeting the needs of your community. So we're going to be looking at assessment tools um, throughout the semester and how different people use them in the field. We're going to have um, a lot of group work. Uh, I'm a big group work person, especially since I have never worked in a children's department where I wasn't part of a group, 
whether it was designing story times or going to do outreach in the schools or going out and doing book talking uh, or developing story hours, um, there was always at least one other person, if not more, involved. So there'll be uh, a, you know, an assignment where only two people are working on it and that will be the design in the early childhood literacy program. And then you're going to actually um, sell that to a group of your peers to see if you're going to get the funding that you're asking for and the permission to uh, implement that program. Um, and then we're going to do a big group project um, that's going to basically talk about, and I'll show you what, what those look like in more detail in a, in a little bit, um, that's going to look at major early uh, childhood literacy issues. Um, the other thing that's really important is that uh, most of the discussions and the workshops I've attended in the past four months have been loaded with discussing new technology and multi-literacies. And how are we using multi-literacy like art, play, uh, dance, uh, singing, all of those different things, including uh, digital technology and computers. How are we using all of that? Um, and what is that form of communication doing on our young children? Now I'm going to pull out that piece about the new technologies because that's where um, a huge debate is raging. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a little bit more, um, in more detail in just a second. So the subjects of course study, and these are just a few, were, um, these are actually <coughs> part of the weekly outlines, and I just wanted to, I'm not going to read them to you, you can, you can quickly read down them, but um, these are basically some of the units that we're going to be studying. Um, I have some other minor ones, but these are, these are, uh, these are basically the, the major ones that we'll do during the 16 weeks that the course is happening. Um, I decided not to do any uh, tests in the truest sense of the word. There won't be quizzes or, or a midterm or a final, um, but we're going to be doing a lot of peer evaluation and a lot of um, group work and trying to make this as interactive a class as possible, uh, as well as um, you writing a couple of major things and uh, being able to tell me your understanding of, of what you're reading and, and how it's affecting your um, critical evaluation of different programs and different theories and different ways to approach um, early childhood literacy. Um, so, I put this in just for fun because I wanted to know uh, if you knew who all these people were. Um, if you're in early childhood um, learning or in education, you should know who all these people are. So I just thought it would be fun if you want to put into the scroll chat, um, how many of you know who the top on the left is? Who is that? These are major ECL folks. Anybody know who that is? Oh dear. <laughs> okay. You have to all take my class. Okay. It's Jean Piaget. So I'm going to try and get my pointer to work here just a second. The pointers hate me. Okay. There we go. Who's this? Anybody? It's Abraham Maslow. This lady is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite people in the world. You all hear emergent literacy? Well, this is Marie Clay, and we're going to talk a lot about her in the class. The importance of play has come back, thank goodness. The first library I worked in, they said, well, we don't pay you to just play with the kids. What do you mean you're just going to play with them? So this is Vivian, excuse me, I was going to cough, sorry. This is Vivian Paley. And if you haven't read her works, she's absolutely astounding, and you should read it. She was trail, trailblazing many, many times ago, and we're going to be looking at her theories as well. So let's jump over here to the guy on the far right. He's another one of my favorite play people. Um, when I was taking um, classes many, many moons ago, uh, we were reading a lot of books about uh, David Elkind, and one of the ones that I really suggest to you to read uh, if you're at all interested in just children, I mean, even if you don't take this class, The Power of Play. It is an, it is an awesome book, and he has written so many good books. Um, just as a parent, I used to read his. So we're going to do a lot of looking at why play is so important. So these two guys here, 
This is Mr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Watson is the founder of behaviorism, okay? And this is B.F. Skinner. He developed radical behaviorism. So when we, you know, you take your core classes and you look at theories of learning and, you know, you're looking at um, cognitism and constructionism and behaviorism, um, these are the pioneers. These are, these are the, the people that put these theories out, did the research, and we're going to be looking uh, a little bit at all of them because most reading programs, most programming, with, whether they know it or not, comes from uh, the work that these people did. And it's so important, I'm trying to get my pointer to turn off, so important that if you go through this ECL class that you have an idea of who these people are and what they look like. So don't feel bad that you didn't know them. Um, I, uh, I, you know, have read a lot about them, but now I'm really into what do they look like? You know, what, what do they look like as they aged? Um, Jean Piaget uh, was someone that I did part of my social work, um, sorry, dissert <coughs> master's dissertation on, and his work is still alive and well today in so many reading programs everywhere. So the new literacy, we keep hearing about the new literacy. Well, my opinion is that, you know, there's a lot of new stuff, but it's repackaged. Um, but one of the things that is really, really becoming obvious when you start reading uh, a lot about what's going on is the librarian or information specialist as parent educator. And this is what um, Brazelton is, is, is really um, looking at. It's, it's part of their foundation, even though SPICE, um, and that's the social, physical, intellectual, creative, and emotional, was developed, um, you know, Jennifer Berkmeyer at Cornell University has done uh, absolutely um, incredible research into uh, parent educators and how parents are really the first educators of their child. Now look at what children's librarians, um, especially those working from birth to um, through toddler, they're at the most critical time for children to be learning. And play is learning. Uh, you know, just, you know, picking up a, a, a rattle and putting it to your mouth is creating a learning environment for that baby's brain. So we're right there on the cutting edge, too. Um, because we are a parent educator, because not only are we educating the child in so many ways, but we can be a part of the parents and the caregivers' education as well. And that's one of um, Piaget and Brazelton. I mean, uh, Dr. Brazelton is, I think, oh gosh, I don't even, I think he's 95, and, and Piaget has been gone for a very long time, but, but they both felt that it was the obligation of, um, of everyone that worked with young children and to educate the parents as well, or, or the caretakers. I don't want to, uh, a lot of kids don't have uh, parents. They have grandparents or they have caretakers, so try and be politically correct about that. So, you know, there's um, the, the ELF 2.0 and, and the Learning with Families 2.0, which was the original uh, state library program. They put out a great model for librarians. And so some of the, um, the qualities that are going to position you um, to be a really good parent educator as a library person or a daycare person or a literacy director or whatever you choose to go into is that you become a facilitator rather than, than using the word teacher or specialist. You empower parents as their primary models for children, but they may not know how to model. We are taught and we are committed to cultural diversity. Those are who we serve. We serve every single you know, group that is in our environment. We provide information about child growth and development, whether it's by our, our collection of professional books or about, you know, educating children about their own bodies. Uh, you know, we provide accurate information about services. We, we basically the whole gambit. So we are in a perfect opportunity to provide parents with good, accurate information. And we also enable parents to be able to share that information. Just think about 
how we share information in story time or how we share information. Um, I put a series of dialog dialogic reading workshops together at my old library job. We had a large Persian um, community and so I worked with um, one of the uh, gentlemen in that community to have parents and grandparents come in and start learning how to use dialogic reading and being able to read to their children in English as well as Farsi because they wanted them to do well in America but yet they were in a totally closed off environment. So we were respecting the Farsi but we were also stretching the boundaries of doing dialogic reading in English. Um, we also have um, a really good connection to the community because we serve the community. So we already know how to do that. So just incorporating all of these parent educators into our programs and also uh, you know, taking pride in our role and taking pride in the work we do and being advocates for children um, and not just the children that we come across every day in our job, but children in general so that we all become part of a system that increases literacy and treats children as individuals. So there's, there's, um, that's all on the State Library site um, if you're interested in more about their philosophy of parent educators, but we're going to cover that a lot. So I want to go back to growing up digital. I love this picture. Um, there's an ongoing debate and I actually got to uh, be a part of <laughs> um, an argument that developed between <clears throat> two people. One was very pro uh, children of any age should be allowed to do whatever they want on a computer, iPhone, iPad, um, Galaxy, whatever. And then the other side is that children um, you know, should not be allowed to work on computers till age five. The truth is uh, probably somewhere in the middle. but. One of the documents that I have studied, uh, which is a 1999 study, but it, it's still it, it's still just basically, um, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics did this study, so it, it it's got a lot of power behind it. But it's basically called media use by children younger than two, and um, it tries to be fair, but it also then goes into uh, a lot of research findings supporting the evidence that um, you know media in general is bad for children under the age uh, younger than two. Uh, there are people on the other side of this argument, though, that say in moderation. Uh, children are ready for this. They're wired differently. Uh, they're growing up in a digital world. And so through this class, we're going to be looking at the pros and cons of both sides of those, looking at current research and seeing uh, what kind of opinions we come out, out with. Uh, my grandchildren were just here over the weekend and my three and a half year old granddaughter is a whiz on iPhone, iPad. Um, there's just it was just amazing to me to watch her just grab your iPhone and go to her games. Um, I mean, it's it's an amazing thing. Now, whether or not we should be letting her do that, she also has a huge imagination and plays uh, by herself for you know an hour or more at a time. So we we kind of feel she's a little balanced, and I, I know that we're probably biased in that. But um, it's a very interesting debate, and so we want to make sure that we're going to discuss that. Okay, so when you think of literacy, do you think of reading only? I hope not. Reading is really important, but we're talking about early childhood literacy and development. And in a lot of ways, the class, we're kind of locked into the title that we have right now, but uh, I would like to see it move more to a literacy and learning or um, the old title way back was reading and development. I think that's a little older. but I wanted just to put up all of these programs um, because there there's so many of them. So what I'm hoping is that my students in the fall will be able to look at all of these, see the commonalities, also see the differences, and then see who's reaching out a little bit further. Um, everything helps you um, succeed. Uh, imaginative play, drawing, painting, writing, singing and reading. So when I, you know, as I said before, when I first started in libraries in the children's department, everything had to be tied to reading. If you presented a program, it had to be tied to reading. And summer reading programs, uh, you know, 
reading clubs, uh, you know, all of that is is 100% valuable. Don't get me wrong, but this class is going to reach further into more multiple literacy um, avenues as well. And I wanted to point out my library used ready to uh, <coughs> every child ready to read. Sorry, my voice is going. And I really liked it. And there were a lot of reasons I liked it, but one of it was that we um, we were allowed to build a lot of interactivity into it so that we not only were looking at the, the basic reading principles, but we were also being able to tie um, a lot of things that you see in uh, the, the old phonological awareness. Uh, that type of thing, but Lonigan, uh, who is a uh, you know if you're you're into uh, uh, phonemes and sensitivity to rhyme, I like people to understand um, that Whitehurst Lonigan that combination and Graver Whitehurst at Syracuse um, was a uh, an incredibly uh, had a lot of effect on me uh, as far as dialogic reading because I saw how dialogic reading uh, worked with children. I then started adding um, a, a broader concept to that to create um, more of a parent singing beforehand. We had uh, stay after and do art afterwards. So we, we started building out our program from just a 20 minute dialogic reading session to a whole program and then we took that program on the road to daycare centers in our district. And so, um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm trying not to look at Lynn's comments in the scroll chat, but um, that's really important that you understand that that's how you can get parents motivated to do things with their kids. Because some parents cannot read well, and you have to be super, super sensitive. No, Lynn, keep posting, keep posting. Um, so the other thing is I, I put this up because I just, I just love um, young children especially when they're exposed to art and to music and to interacting with each other without a lot of parental involvement. The parents are there or the caregivers are there, but they're just allowed to be children. They're just allowed to experiment. So I put this up because um, the toddler toddle hop was one of my favorite, uh, and you can Google that and it'll bring up what it is, but not only did it have cute graphics, but um, it, it was just a play, it was just a musical playtime, art and music playtime for kids, and it was chaos. And but at the same time, uh, it made parents relax and they could talk to each other and they could say, oh, what, you know, what, what is your baby doing or are you, is your baby walking yet or, you know, oh, I'm having trouble with potty training or, oh, I just can't find the time to read to my child, you know, and so, so you're creating a more relaxed environment. There's a time for everybody to sit still and there's a time for everybody to be able to go crazy. And so what we're hoping is that we're going to be looking at developing programs that are really rich and creative in a whole different um, look at multiliteracy. So it's beyond story time now. You know, story time is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Every library should do story time and build on their story time programs and and invite groups in the community that, that don't have story time. Uh, we had daycare centers attend ours and we always had full story times and um, we were a real resource to the community in that. But we also started networking out to where everything, every children and families were. So not everybody's going to come to your library, but if you can do some outreach, and again, this is all based on budgets and staffing and all kinds of things we're not going to get into tonight, but an ideal program is one that is looking at this kind of interconnected circle. And so you see that you've got community, you've got informal community groups. Now, what's an informal community group? We used to use the senior citizen storytelling group. They were retired teachers, uh, retired librarians. There was about nine of them. They were in a senior citizen's retirement village uh, down the road, and they wanted to come and do story times, and they were hysterical. 
Uh, they did a lot of Mother Goose, but they were hysterical. They made their own costumes. They were an informal community group. They were really connected to the city council. They were connected in so many different ways. So they then started, um, you know, talking us up, and so all of a sudden we had other community agencies wanting us to have things in the library. So it's all connected. That's all I'm trying to tell you. Is and, and if you're only doing story time, and you know that used to be good enough, it's not anymore because libraries are are becoming more and more and more uh, the center of the community. So we have to provide support for all our parent caregivers. I know that in some parts of the country this might be controversial, but there are a lot of, of, of people that will walk through your door into a literacy program that um, may not look like uh, the traditional parent or the traditional caregiver, but each and every one of them um, needs to have program support at your library or um, if you're working uh, just in literacy and like in a school district. Um, you have to be aware of all the different combinations out there and, and where your children are and what kind of living environments they're in and what kind of support they need. So I went way back way, way, way back um, and looked at um, some of, and I spelled research wrong, I'm, I apologize. I was up doing this at like midnight last night, so I apologize. I do know how to spell research, by the way. Um, I love the part in red because this is what, when I graduated from library school, this is what I was told was going to be my, um, basically my role. I was going to help parents that were a little bit uncomfortable with reading to their kids. I was going to model for them. Um, I was going to help them. This is like, oh sure, how do, I, how do I know how to help parents develop their own literacy? Well, this class is one of the reasons why we want to make sure that they can. I'm not making fun of this. I'm just saying that at the time, this was developed out of, of Pennsylvania state <coughs> government. Uh, Solano and Newman in 2001 were two of the best researchers in children's literacy development in the country. Um, so this was very accurate. But let's look at how that's changed now when we look at Brazelton. Um, and again, the, um, the reason why I'm, I'm telling you about Brazelton is in part is because if you do live in California or even in some other part of the country, you should see if any of these partnerships are being formed. So this is the State Library's partnership is with the Brazelton Institute. Uh, Dr. Nugent, uh, found, he was the founder of the Brazelton Foundation, and that, that basically was put together in 1995. Dr. Brazelton, the picture on the bottom right, he was the founder of the Brazelton Touchpoint Center. So you got the foundation, which is getting lots and lots of money, and then you've got the Touchpoint Center, which is developing the model and the theory. And these guys are, are connected with Boston Children's Hospital. They're connected with Harvard. They're medical doctors. They're, they're totally committed to uh, children. They, they have been in pediatrics. They have uh, worked with communities on parent training and on, you know, teaching young mothers how to nurse, all that medical stuff. And now they're looking at their model needs to go deeper. It needs to go into institutions where there are children and not necessarily, um, you know, in a medical facility. So, and, and touch points is a very, um, their site is really good. Um, they have a, their model of development is all over the place. But I, I attended this workshop, and one of the things that stood out to me is that I, all of the things that I felt that I had learned through working with children was expressed by these people, and that my looking at librarianship and also uh, even my role as um, the manager of collection development for my school district that. I was going to be an educator. Um, and it may not be an educator of the child, but it might be of the caretaker or the parent. So Brazelton has a, a few things I really like. Um, they like to look for opportunities to support mastery. And this means that if you have a young couple come in, and in the, um, in the presentation that I attended a, two weeks ago, they had this great slide up of this young African-American kid with two babies. He had had twins and really did not have any uh, 
points to, to, to reference for himself on how he was going to help these children develop and get a better life that he had. And so well, he came to the Brazelton Center. Um, he was basically the baby was born at the Children's Hospital in Boston. And they started looking at what can you do and, and started supporting him on what he could do, not on what he couldn't do or what he didn't know. They're big on not bringing your beliefs and your biases into anything. And as librarians, we're perfect for that because that's what we're trained not to do. We're trained to keep them to ourselves and to not bring them into interaction with, uh, interaction with our patrons. Um, as librarians, we do focus on the child, but now we're going to widen it. We're going to um, focus on the parent. And yes, I built a collection of, of professional books that like how to breastfeed your baby, how to, how to potty train your baby. But now we're going to start creating programs for those parents to come, to come to. And they're not going to just all be about literacy, but they may be just an opportunity to come and have your baby um, attend a playtime. And then through that, we're going to disperse information to you really, um, I'm not going to say insidiously, but we're going, to, we're going to do it in such a way that we're going to give you an opportunity to learn without making it scary. And we're going to value uh, above all things the relationship that you have with your child as a parent. And so I, those things really touched me as a children's librarian. It's kind of what I wanted to do in story time, but that this is blowing it up into a lot of different uh, areas in programming. The opportunities are endless. So the multiliteracy approach. <clears throat> Dr. Marianne Harlan and I uh, have, have lots of conversations about multi, multiliteracies. And because of my teaching background, I've been a member of, of NCTE, which is the uh, Teachers of English. National Association for years and years and years. And I pulled this out the other night and I crossed, I started crossing out teaching and putting in children's services. So that's where you're going to see a lot of teaching speak here. But um, it's, it's the numerical numbers that I wanted to share with you tonight. Um, we have to incorporate multiple modes of communication into our programming and into our um, interactions uh, when we're working with children and caregivers. We need to um, go way, way, way beyond just something that illustrates a point. We need, we need to uh, communicate it in, in different ways, in current ways. And the second one is that children do this automatically. They can combine all kinds of things. And if you observe children, especially if you're a storyteller and you sit and you watch a story hour come together with, from the moment they start coming into the room to the moment they leave, they're all over the place. And so it, it, it works perfectly to now do this with parents and show them that when their children play or when their children, um, you know, uh, just the mere fact of talking to your child and the value of that. So, you know, you can't be in a repressed literacy environment uh, and not be exposed to this maybe at school, but you, we need to reach out and make sure that those those children that are in those impoverished areas can at least get the service from the library. They can come and do those things, all those multi-literacy things at the library or at the daycare center. Excuse me, I'm going to uh, turn my mic off for a minute while I cough, sorry. So I met um, a librarian from the uh, Vancouver Public Library. And She's involved in, um, she wrote an article, it's called, uh, her name is Tess Pendergrass, sorry. And in Children in Libraries in 2011, she wrote a wonderful article called Beyond Storytime. And it was basically about collaborating in com communities. And her library could not afford to pump up the library staff. But what they did do is that they created what they called an early years community program. And it's run through the library. It's a separate staff, and this staff goes out into the community. Um, they are, they're funded separately, um, and you can tell that if you were writing a grant um, that this is uh, something that strengthens the community. It's an outreach program through the library, and so that's why in this class we're going to look at outreach opportunities, and basically just like um, 
Hayward Public Library here has a great homework help center after school that's part of the library but separate from the library. Uh, it's staffed by volunteers. It has a separate um, you know, person that's in charge of running it. And so that's what this Vancouver program is. But it also um, goes hand in hand with the library in that it draws people into the library. Uh, and you can see they're still looking at stories. They're still looking at you know, cognitive development. Um, they're a very whole child, looking at the whole child, not just parts of the child. And they are looking at what we, each and every one of us has to deal with, which is children that are in multi, um, in, in um, bilingual situations where they may be speaking only Chinese at home and then having to deal with an English world. And so they're very, they're very uh, attuned to that in their programming as well and have programs that deal in multiple languages. So it's a, it's a wonderful article. It's available through the, the King Library and I'm sure through most of your other libraries. And in a, in a while, I'll, I'll tell you how you can um, get a hold of the um, bibliography I'm going to be putting together uh, for the class, and I'd be more than happy to share that with you if you're interested. So I know I'm trying to watch the time, so the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, how I've organized the class. And so um, collaborate sessions, we're going to have two, we're having three, one's for the group presentation, and the other two are basically to introduce you to um, people that are either uh, employers, um, that are either with the State Library and they're going to talk about how these programs are created. And then I'm also bringing in people that actually are on the, on the um, front lines um, dealing with um, mostly with uh, early literacy from the new perspective and talking about uh, you know, how you can incorporate literacy into just about every program. I'm really excited um, that Patrick Reamer, who is at Contra Costa County, is coming because he will be uh, absolutely wonderful to listen to. He has done so much with programming um, at his library branch. Uh, and then Sen Campbell is an absolutely amazing person. She's our uh, computer and children expert, and she's fascinating to talk to. So I'm hoping to give um, students um, you know, a, a look out from just the, the reading and the class activities. Um, as I said, we're going to be doing um, two things of group work, and uh, I'm hoping that um, these are going to, to work. I never know from... Um, you know, when you're first designing the class, whether or not um, things are going to be exactly or if they're going to be tweaked, and that's where SOTS will come in and where input will come in from students taking the course. Uh, I'm hoping I become more knowledgeable so that I can bring more and more um, richness into the classes as we develop it. We're going to have discussion threads. I'm, I'm big on discussion threads because I, I like students to, to talk about what we're reading. Um, I'm bringing in a research paper because I, I think you need to know how to write and do some research, and I'm basically going to be focusing it on the theories and theorists. Uh, and then I'm going to have everybody keep a blog. I'm going to review that blog throughout the semester, and I'm hoping that uh, ideas, opinions, uh, concerns, um, what you want to learn, what you think you need to do, what you, you know, you're getting out of the reading or a guest speaker or whatever, that you're capturing it all in that blog, and that will be an entire semester, um, semester of work. And I just want all of you um, to think about just imagine the impact you could have on a child and their family if you can incorporate all of these different things and take it out into the community that you end up working in. Because one person can make a, a world of difference to a child. And one child, you know, to me is, um, you know, just as important as a, a whole bunch of people. So if you reach one child and you help their family get out of poverty through literacy, um, then we're, we're doing our job correctly. So that's, that's about it. I, I could talk like for another three hours, but um, I wanted to see if any of you had some questions. And again, thank you so much for your attention. I, I, I really enjoyed talking about this. I'm sorry I went so quickly. Um, I can be uh, reached through the 
through the SLIS website. There's a faculty link and you can get to my email there. If you would like me to uh, keep your email and then send you the bibliography after I, I get it finished in about a month, I will be happy to send it to you at that time. And that will have all the readings um, that are going to be in the class, but also there will be a lot of readings that aren't going to be. Okay, any questions? Or any comments, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are too in the little bit of time we have remaining. Mary Pearl, I worked at uh, Lone Tree Library in Douglas County. I worked for Jamie LaRue. Oh, my home library, Denver Public. I used to I used to live right by Cherry Creek. iPads in libraries, Tom, is that saying you think they need to be there? Or are you asking a question about whether I think they should be there? So Marquita, I'll just turn it back to you then. Thank you very much for asking me. I'm a big no on the iPad for story time. Um, I could discuss that with you offline. Um, I think it, I've seen people using them, but for me, uh, my experience is I, I don't bring too much technology into story time unless it's digital storytelling where you're logging on and watching a story time. But that's just me. I know they're coming. I included the link for the, um, the survey. If you guys would please um, submit that, that would be wonderful. We're going to actually use the results to um, do some more programming in the future, we, and we would love to hear your responses. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, feel free to um, go onto our Facebook site. And this will be archived, and it will be archived on the Facebook site if you want to go over it again. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.